gets Mission Hill style me. So a few days ago, I put out what happened to Mission Hill, and luckily I was able to score an interview with one of the wildly talented creators of the show, Bill Oakley. I used a few clips from it in my video. Now, I recorded this interview over Zoom, so I apologize in advance for the low quality camera, but I think the stories that Bill shares are just fascinating, so please bear with me bumbling through my first interview at low quality. Uh, I go um, uh, so much. Thank you, Bill Oakley, for responding to me on Instagram and giving me this interview. Check out his steamed ham society on Patreon for some interesting food-related goodies. And subscribe to me, duh. All right, interview time. Thank you very much, Bill Oakley, for being here on my little channel. Hello. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yes, yeah, so we didn't already say hello before this. Uh, <laughs> the illusion of YouTube. <laughs> so... We're here to talk about Mission Hill. Uh, I, I did a big whole video deep dive on Mission Hill. It's not out yet, but it will be out by the time this interview goes out. So that's nice. Uh, you've you created Mission Hill. You've also written for The Simpsons. You worked on Futurama. You've written for regular show, close enough. I mean, that's amazing too. Big fans of those. But Mission Hill was such an amazing show. It was a hidden gem like The Oblongs for me, which I made another video on. Um, I want to ask you about, I guess the first part is the Oblongs faced a lot of uh, interference with the WB. Uh, I, WB. I, okay. I realize you guys didn't face as much interference, but was, was there any? Very little. I mean, well, I, first of all, let me begin this preamble by saying Josh Weinstein, Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein, it wasn't just me. We did all this stuff together. Yes. Of um, course, although of the course. recent stuff you're talking about, I have not done I, close enough and all that regular show stuff I did solo. Um, <clears throat> Mission Hill Simpsons, it was Bill Oakley and Josh Weinstein. So yes. we, uh, the WB was actually, they were actually pretty terrific, except for the fact that they didn't really promote the show. And like, here's the thing that happened with Mission Hill. We pitched the show to the WB. First of all, there was, a, let me just take you back to this time when Please. many of your viewers probably were not alive. Okay. We're talking about mid nineties, uh, mid to late nineties. The Simpsons was the only animated show on the air. The first one that had been on since the Flintstones in the 1960s, gigantic smash hit. Nobody thought it was going to be a hit. So at that, so later on, there was a couple different waves of people trying to catch the, uh, catch the, you know, that lightning in a bottle again. First, there were some, there was third, <laughs> There are fish police capital critters were the first two ones. You probably don't remember those, but this was, I, ha was I have them written in my phone to check out because you've mentioned them in another interview. And I, I, I was like, I need to look at those. Both of this, there was a strange wave of people not getting what made the Simpsons popular and just thinking that any old cartoon, even if it was about talking animals, a fish police, literally fish police, capital <laughs> critters, they were critters that lived, the critters, rats and things that lived in the US Capitol. Okay, so these were shows that were on. Then people got a slightly different, when King of the Hill came out in around 19, what was it, 97, 98, people began to realize, oh, maybe the cartoons, maybe it's the, the humans in the cartoons, maybe it's kind of a somewhat realistic look at humans. Let's try that. And so around this time, there was um, a number of shows, this is 98, 99, that were being sold. Futurama was one. Mission Hill was another, and there were a couple other ones, which I don't remember. There was like God the Devil and Bob. There was um, Stressed Eric, I think, which was an import from England that they just revoiced, things like that. So Mission Hill, during this big wave, Josh and I had worked on The Simpsons, had run The Simpsons for a couple of years. And one of the things we noticed about The Simpsons was there no, there's only one character between the ages of 12 and 34, which is Otto, <laughs> who is not even that fun to write for. And we were like, well, what, are we, what if we did a show that was almost all characters between the ages of 12 and 34? And so we created Mission Hill. And, and it was based, all the characters were based on people we knew. Um, there was also Gus and Wally, who were the neighbors. Um, they were the only ones that were older. Um, There's, you know, in their set, late 60s or the 70s. Which I love, though, because that also age group never really got attention like even on the simpsons if you were written that old you were like about to croak was the joke is oh you're about to die it wasn't like totally. you were actually written like a three-dimensional character it, it I, I agree with you um and that was one of the reasons we put them in there um because we wanted to have a completely different cast than the simpsons um and we also wanted to set the show in a city in an urban setting and we basically particularly a, a hip part of town back before gentrification eliminated most of those things yeah um so we pitched the show around we pitched it to nbc nbc did not like it they said it was an animated rent and rent was the biggest broadway musical of the time so that i thought that but you know it wasn't right for nbc during the must-see tv era okay. we also pitched it to fox who rejected it we pitched it to wb who loved it wb now this you got to remember 
there used to be a network called the WB, yes. <laughs> which was the Warner Brothers Network. There also used to be a network called UPN, uh, which we also had a show on a few years later. Um, WB Network was not, was not really known for anything at this time. It was a it was just a random conglomeration of show of very forgettable shows, and we were excited because they were very enthusiastic about Mission Hill, uh, unlike NBC and Fox. They were very enthusiastic about it. They loved it, and they ordered basically right out of the gate. They just said, "We want it. We want thirteen episodes," and we were like, "This is this is great. This is perfect. It's, it's our dream come true." And the people at the actually at the WB were very nice. Um, and, and but what happened? <laughs> Between the time that we created the show, we sold them the show, and the time the show got on the air, was they finally found their niche. And their niche was they're going to be the Teenage Girl Network because Buffy took off like a rocket. And then it was like, we're going to have Buffy, we're going to have Charm, we're going to have Popular, we're going to have all these shows at Roswell. That's nothing but one hour shows that are about teenage girls and the teenage girls like. And we were like, oh, this is not going the way that we had hoped. Okay. But then they did have one night. They had one night from that was a leftover from their old from before they became a teenage girl network that was a, that had the Jamie Foxx show and had the Steve Harvey show yep. and another show like that which were very popular but not their normal thing so they were like yeah well where are we gonna do a Mission Hill we'll put Mission Hill on that night <laughs> and that night and we we're gonna lead off the night at eight o'clock leading in to Steve Harvey and Jamie Foxx and it was a Titanic disaster we we are murdering the ratings of <laughs> Jamie Foxx and Steve Harvey, <laughs> and we're ruining their night of, of those comedies. And we just got canceled like three weeks. We, they aired two, they had three episodes, and that was it. Um, then later they they aired uh, they aired a couple more during the summer, and again it was damaging their <laughs> their reruns. Of Jamie I, I know. I remember. Harvey. I remember you saying it in one interview maybe that. I, I, one of you demanded that the show be premiered after Buffy and you were going to try to get Buffy's audience. Yeah. And it and... didn't work at all. <laughs> um, we did, we did, we did, we did a couple things like that. Um, we demanded that we, we asked to put the show on in the fall and they did. Usually these shows come on mid animated shows have historically come on in mid season, but we wanted it to be on the fall schedule. We also, um, and we did, we did, we had a, we strongly believed that the audience, the kind of a younger, hipper audience that Buffy, that like Buffy wanted to watch Mission Hill, but it did not, that it did not translate. Um, I would say the thing about the WB is the people were really nice. They really liked the show. They really, they, they, one of the executives, one of the highest executives said, this is the only show on this network I would watch. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, wow, thank you. And they they were really, the only thing that happened was well, you could tell that the air was going out of the balloon a few months before we started to premiere because they were so excited about their huge success with these teenage girl shows that they didn't really promote Mission Hill. They basically, they kind of ignored its existence uh. at the at the upfront. They, they, they said, they said, there, you got it. Four new one hour shows. Uh, neglecting the fact that we were also one of the shows <laughs> um they had like ads you'd see ads in the thing about like the fall schedule that we didn't even mention us in the wb thing and we were like this something is going wrong here but we didn't really know that for sure until the show premiered to its rate to its ratings and i would also say the, fun, the other fun thing about this is the show got some got a few spectacular reviews like from variety and from one other place, but most of the other reviews were very bad. I know, oh, I, I love your Weekly. vitriol you have towards the I publications. Fucking, I fucking hate Entertainment Weekly for this reason. And I know, I actually know a couple people, a guy who works through, very nice guy that I've communicated with over the years. And they actually did, uh, we, we did have a, um, they were very nice on some of our other shows. But on this particular show, this particular critic said it was awful. And I couldn't fucking believe that. I mean, the show, even if you don't like the show, it's not awful. Oh. Why would you say that? Oh and it God. made me so mad. Um, anyway, and I'm still mad about it. I know the person. That goes, I'm mad about it. I'm still <laughs> mad about it. Critic. But it wasn't, it wasn't just them. A lot of places, most places didn't even review it. But it's because it of the bad the promo, right? They sent out that. The promo that, wasn't that bad. That it wasn't. Well, bad I mean, at yeah, all. it wasn't that bad. It was just that it, it was. It was just kind of playing it like it was an average cartoon, I guess. And it, it really have, wasn't. You guys had a more a more introspective cartoon than than that time. Like really, you were ahead of, ahead of the well. curve on that. It did not play well at the upfronts, which was when they show the clips of all the new shows to the advertisers. 
Um, and it wasn't that bad though. It was just, it was just a clip of, of a few scenes from the pilot that didn't get any laughs from a, a group That's... of advertising executives who were New York, 40 year old New York advertising executives. Um, you know, and like that wasn't the audience for the show. Anyway, but they weren't, they were the ones, this was the best part here. Somebody found this. There were, so, there were a lot of bad reviews. Um, this was the capper though. In one of those supermarket tabloids, uh, I think it was, it wasn't Weekly World News, it was one of those other ones, like The Sun or whatever. They had death row inmates. I think they just made this up, but death row inmates rank the new fall shows. <laughs> and the death row inmates hated Mission Hill. It was the worst. What? It, they hated it more than any other TV show. Now, I think that those, they probably just made that up. Yeah. But it was still, it still aggravated me. That, that, I don't think, you know, I, honestly, I think that if they had really pulled death row inmates, our show would not have done so bad. I think that that was made up. Anyway, so there you go. So this is so what happened was Josh and I had worked for two years with a staff of absolutely brilliant writers and animators, Lauren McMullen, who designed this one of the best animators that ever lived. Um, I'm and gonna then ask more like, about her later. I got questions about genius. her. Um, we the show is just unceremoniously bam, it's over. And I remember that they think. No, oh, one sec. Audio cut out. The executives who we oh, dealt with we were very nice. Called us on the phone. And they were like, so guys, hey, we want to talk to you, Bill and Josh, from the speakerphone. And someone came into their office while they were talking to us and said, so we're, we're pulling, we're, we're canceling Mission Hill, right? <laughs> and what? they were like, shut up, shut up. They hadn't told us yet. Uh... But the first intruder into their office, and we were like, we kind of knew it was coming anyway. But but that that was a funny, it's a hilariously oh. awkward moment. A lot of stuff in those late months of 1999 really went wrong in a spectacular fashion um, with the show. And that was it, it was just like, okay, well, that's it. And we actually, cause you know, they had, the people at the network, God bless them, most of them loved the show. They had already ordered five more episodes. Uh, you know, we had, there's not just the original 13. I'm sure you know this as a scholar of Mission Hill. There's five more episodes. Please, please, I, I'm gonna use some of this footage. I'll cut it in now. I was gonna use footage from other people's interviews, but I love that I can use it from my own interview. So please get to, uh, I love you retelling it as much as you can. Okay. Don't worry. Were they or they loved the show. They thought it was coming out great as did we, and the network ordered five more episodes. And this was before the show had originally aired and we wrote the scripts. So those were the, probably the, uh, some of the best episodes of the series because we were really cooking. We really knew the characters. The writers were really um, on a roll and we wrote five more episodes. There's five scripts um, in which were, they were beginning to animate them. And some of them are partially animated. So you yep. can find them online. The, um, the All five scripts are online. And one act of one animatic, which is the uh, Crappy Weekend and the Freaky Crow, Crap, Crow Wagon episode is on YouTube, black and white animated. So good. <laughs> then, and there's also um, a full table reading of an episode about Andy and Gwen's relationship. Um, I think it was Pretty in Pink, it might've been called. It was a, a it was about the, the pink eye and he had it it was about the any men's relationship the, the table reading of that with the storyboards kind of so it's kind of like an animatic is also online another episode that was one of my favorites um that and alone, it was sweet. the table read is like it's almost just it, it's like entertaining in itself because you really get to hear everyone just laugh at the jokes organically and these actors kind of give their spontaneous take you know it's not a, a you know oh I, we got this perfect take you can hear them just on the fly give these performances and bounce off each other i, I it was super entertaining just to watch that alone i'm like those this readings needs were to be so on the fun. dvd this was definitely the best i mean but the, when josh and i were running the show it was really fun we had a good atmosphere we had good working hours and it was kind of like a little bit of a party a lot of the time. Now I know that like at the, today you can't really do this, but there was a <laughs> lot of drinking at the office and there was a lot of partying. We had a really incredible Christmas party um, and everybody got along really well. We all, you know, we take the staff after the table, we have the table readings at night, unlike most shows, we had the table readings at night and then we take everybody out to a really fancy dinner after the table readings, um, which was another, I remember those were so fun. Um, and so like, it was a great experience from A to Z, except for the fact that the show was a huge flop. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's yeah, it's kind of been a, just a theme throughout my entire thing is that you guys were just class acts in terms of management. You guys really Thank just you. ran an amazing ship, it seemed like, and, every, and that's what everyone said, I, what is it? 
was a Scott Menville or someone on the behind the scenes, someone said jokingly when they arrived at the studio, oh my gosh, it looks so great here. This isn't going to last. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, this isn't going to be open soon. It, it, it was true to because be true. we had, we did have, um, because a lot of what we did on Mission Hill was a reaction to things that we hadn't liked at The Simpsons or we had liked. And so we had a really nice office in a really great area. It wasn't like, it wasn't like a weird off, like sometimes people, many TV shows are done out in the, real cheap areas of deep, of deep deep suburbs in old crummy office buildings we said we're not doing that <laughs> and we had it the office was in a really nice building modern beautiful in santa monica in a beautiful area where you could walk to stuff and restaurants and 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 like it was so it was just like anyway i don't i don't want to bore you with these details no but i love those it details fun, it, it's stuff it was, i included in my i found them to be important again i feel like that shows your guys is uh priorities you you weren't just cranking out a show you you cared about each staff member that you brought on you wanted them to care about the show as much as you did and that's what you got which is why again it's just so sad is the show's quality you can feel that every single person who worked on that show was loving it and cared about every single detail I remember Tom Kenny telling us the show was going to go for 10 seasons, at least when we fought, we were, we were doing the ADR for the first episode. He was like, this is fantastic. And, uh, you know, and it's like the TV business is very aggravating. That means it's like, it, and it was, it's, let me just say this about this. I think Mission Hill could have been far more successful had it not been on that network. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah, yep. that network was not the place for it. And at that time, it, it, it could have been immensely successful had it been on, had it could have started on Adult Swim or, was on a streaming service, you know, these days, because the fact there was the time slot, you know, now you don't have to worry so much about your time slot on TV because many things, most TV shows, you watch when you want. You don't watch them at 8.30 when they're broadcast, but back then you did. And so the time slot was everything. Um, and that was what killed this show. Uh, that and the fact that it was on the wrong network. Could, could because uh, I, I kind of speculate this, people ask, oh, well, yeah, why didn't Adult Swim continue it? And I think it's just, could they have produced it? They were producing stuff like Sea Lab 2021 back then, not they, Rick and Morty. So it's like, could you? They have put up the one million dollar budget per episode no, that you get. Exactly. No, they, could not. they got it. They got this at a fire sale price. This is the, yeah. you know, people like God bless Adult Swim for picking up this show. But they never had any. We didn't. Know, no one ever asked us about it. We never had any contact with anyone from Adult Swim. We just saw that the show had appeared. Like I think three years later, we were like. Hey, did you know the show's on on this new thing uh. called Adult Swim? <laughs> like they never called us. They never had any. No one ever told us anything about it. It just <sighs> appeared on TV, and we were like, "Wow, that's kind of cool." And then they ran it over and over and over for like four years, um, and simultaneously, it started appearing on other places like Teletoon in Canada, mm -hmm. which is their Adult Swim, and and overseas, um, and in like Estonia, it was very popular. Brazil, and I think Argentina, it was very popular. Uh, I think Mexico too. And it basically what happened was Warner Brothers was just selling this cheap. They're just like, can you, can you, buy? Adult Swim was like, let us have whatever you got that's cheap. <laughs> and that's what they got. They got Mission Hill because it was cheap and it was owned by the same company. And they were just like, so, it flopped so hard. So then it's not like the executives yeah. are going to care about it anymore. It's unfortunate, no. but it's like, yeah, the investment's just kind of over at that point. Exactly. Exactly. And we didn't get any money for that kind of thing. We didn't get any money. But what we did, and then this is where we now come out of the tail end of the story the show finally found its audience. That's the, that's the silver lining. The show finally found an audience on Mission Hill, not only because it was the right time with the right audience, but also because they ran it relentlessly over and over and over. And so people got to those, those people God liked it, got to see those things over and over. And it was, it, and, and that's like, that's where it ended up. So, and then now we come out on the very tail end of the story. I think they stopped running it. Like what did they stop running it? Like 2010 or something like that. Yeah, so got a good like show, seven seven years or so. It was nice. The show vanished from the popular <laughs> from wherever it had appeared because mm -hmm. it just like they stopped running it. There's nowhere to see. You can buy the DVDs, but they're kind of hard to find these days. And the yeah. DVDs also don't have the original music, as you as as I'm yep. sure you know, um, because they didn't want to pay the money for the music. So um, those so that's where it is now. And but what we discover is that people still like the show. Like almost every day, Josh and I on Twitter, people are asking us about Mission Hill. And every, and frankly here, people often like, you know, I, people literally get, I go to a coffee shop and the person is like, you're, oh, you're in Bell Oakley. I love Mission Hill. People say that like that, like people 
have a very fond recollection of Mission Hill um, that I hope we can somehow exploit into getting it on the air again. Me too. I guess that's where this conversation is leading. Exactly. Leading. Oh, definitely is where it'll be going. We're going to, we're going to talk a lot about Mission Hill's possible future, Gus and Wally and all of that here. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, why not? We'll start off with that. We'll just get into the serious bit first before we get into more fun interview questions. Let's, uh, let's talk about this. So you guys, um, I, I know you said that you think, uh, first we'll talk about Mission Hill. You, you, I've heard they did the five episodes and I guess WB still has those files somewhere in a, and someone could buy the rights off I hope, for I hope them so. and all that. We're, oh, we're, yeah, that's hope, part of what hope. we're selling. This is what we're doing now. I say, I'll just, let me set the stage for this so that everybody Please. knows what we're talking about. Please. Two and a half years ago, Josh and I came up with a, 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 a notion of it's not such a reboot of Mission Hill. It's just kind of continuation of Mission Hill. They would have an increased emphasis on Gus and Wally. You know, it's gone through a couple of different stages. It's called it's not called Gus and Wally anymore. It's literally just called Mission Hill, but it's Mission Hill season two. Um, and this is okay, okay. what what um, what we just we just kind of come up. We came up with what has happened in these characters' lives, and we upgraded the show. We upgraded basically Gus and Wally are now as important as everyone else. They're not minor characters. They are they are important. There'll be more Gus, Gus and Wally episodes because mm -hmm. that last the last episode of the series was that flashback one. That may have been the most popular one of all time. Mm, so we heart. were like, we want more episodes like that. We want Gus and Wally to appear more regularly. And that was the thing. But there's also been other things. I don't know how much of this I should give away. There's other changes that have happened with the roommates and stuff. The show. Anyway, so we came up with this thing. We took it to Warner Brothers, Warner, back to Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers was on board. Warner Brothers has to be doing the Warner Brothers because they own the show. There's no not. It has to be done under their corporate umbrella, period. Yes. They're not going to give it to someone else. So, But they're enthusiastic about it, which is good. Um, it's now been two and a half years, though, and we still haven't sold it. Uh, mm -hmm. well, the first thing we did, it took about a year and a half to make the deal because it's such a complicated deal. And we're also de dealing with de dealing with a lot of contracts and stuff that are over 20 years old. Which should show their be... passion, people. These men love the show. They want it right. to happen. They're willing to wait a year and a half talking to corporate bureaucracy <laughs> executives and oh, yeah. wait through that. Okay, they love it. So, so we are now in the process of trying to pitch it to various places. Now, you would think, I would have thought, that places would be jumping at it, but they are not. This is the part that is extremely frustrating, and I'll get into this in more detail uh, down the road um, as we continue this conversation. Yeah. But the show, let's just say the show's passionate fan base is not the people who are making decisions about what they buy and put on <laughs> these, these streaming services. Like the streaming service, we're pitching it to streaming services, and um, the streaming services have a certain need for a certain type of thing which is not this <laughs> and so they are like some of the people have heard of mission hill some and have some fondness for it others have not um and in general like it's not particularly um let's say it's not as easy as sell as we thought it would be um because uh i'll, I'll, I'll get into this in a little bit exactly what the problems with it are are extremely <laughs> extremely aggravating but in any case I hope that one of these places, we're still in the process of pitching it. We just pitched it Friday to another place. Um, one of these places will see the light um, because the show is really good. It's basically just continuing. The sh it's, not, it's not a reboot. It's not anything else. It's just season two. And the season two starts about, season two starts approximately six months from where episode 18 ended up. Um, so it's late 1999, 2000. Now this is one of the things also, the show is a period piece now. It did, was not a period piece when it aired. It took place in the present day. Now it still takes place in 1999. So it's a period piece. Period You're pieces are You're foolish scary. though. Who likes nostalgia <laughs> anymore? We hate and everything nowadays is nostalgia. It's like, it's such a good I idea know. to be able to swap. Yeah, I know. I thought that was really good. And that's a, that's a time period that has yet to also really be hit hard in media is the early nineties, like right at 2000. Yeah. That's so... I, I, I thought that was a genius idea. Again, I'm like, Stranger Things is gigantic. And that thing is all filled with nostalgia of their time period. The process of getting stuff on the air is very annoying and it has been since television was invented. And it, you got to navigate all these various people 
who don't have any affection for your project <laughs> and literally just see numbers you know as to what numbers it strikes now we're in a very different environment these days too because of streaming services all competing there are big five literally i think it's 580 or 590 scripted shows on the air these days and um you know our show has a very passionate fan base but it is not the normal it's it's somewhat as it was back then it's somewhat of an alternative audience which you think that people would be thrilled to lure in an alternative audience but whoever their bosses are are like i don't fucking want that <laughs> they, mm-hmm. they 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 are more interested in whatever is going to appeal to a large chunk of mainstream uh, viewers yeah and that's just flawed thinking again because it, again nowadays we have all these we have shows like uh rick and morty which i think is completely weird and alternative and it's meta and introspective and it's about a young boy and an old man literally older than Gus and Wally's age and it's the biggest show it broke Adult Swim into the mainstream it really did it's changed Adult Swim into being a big heavy hitter where now everyone's they they grabbed on to Rick and Morty like oh okay yeah people don't know when a show is going to be big because it's not about the demographic you can't you can't go to school for creativity. You can't just fill in the blocks and get a good show. That's not how a show works. That was the problem with the WB and all those other shows. The critters in the White House, like you said, they just thought <laughs> anything would be good. It's like, no, that's not what makes well, a show good. It is It is not. Look, I don't think there's, I would say this is the case. I don't think Mission Hill is ever going to be as big as Rick and Morty. Rick and Morty has is a fresh new thing that is very funny, very well written, and it is very original. Mission Hill is a show, is an old show, and it is a very realistic show, you know, that is not like, it doesn't have the sci-fi angle. Mm. Um, it's a show, it's kind of just a show, uh, observational show about a life, whereas, and so therefore it's unlikely to, it's unlikely to blow up in the way that Rick and Morty is. Uh, I mean, I, you say that, and also King of the Hill is now looked back on. At least it's one of those things where, yeah, maybe it didn't, it's it's so strange because King of the Hill at the time I didn't I don't remember anyone really talking about it like in my age demographic and now on YouTube there's just video essays with millions upon millions of views talking about all the stupidest fan theories of King of the Hill like people will take any information they can about the show and it's so down to earth and non like non fantastical it's just it's because you don't know when a show is going to take off and why do so many people relate to an old man from texas that's not who these people i know watch and that show, show people on. have erased that from popular thinking because family guy obliterate like oh I'll, let, let, let me let me take you behind the scenes of the tv Ooh. business a one president of a network and this was guy was president of at least two networks had a thing called the animation imperative which is, he invented this phrase and this concept, which is, and the concept is, why does this show have to be animated? Okay? Yeah. And every, this infected the thinking of everyone who buys animated television, because it was, King of the Hill did not have to be animated. Yep. And so that is completely, King of the Hill was on for like, what, 10 seasons? It was immensely mm-hmm. successful. But that show is, that show um, is not his, doesn't fit into his theory. Right. So what happened was Family Guy came along and it had a talking dog and a talking baby and this stuff. And that's, well, that fits in the animation imperative perfectly. So what you are constantly running up against when pitching animated shows is people who somehow, executives who have somehow absorbed this guy's theory of thinking that is, why does a show have to be animated? Mission Hill does not fit that mm-hmm. because it doesn't have any talking animals, doesn't have any crazy crap. And, and, say, and so it doesn't so also that's why it's often rejected right out of like wow, now that's wow. bob's yeah, burgers I, I never thought another never thought that. show like that doesn't that couldn't have to be animated is bob's burgers bob's burgers is probably the most successful primetime animated show of the past yeah, yeah and again 15 years right that doesn't have to be animated yeah, but right. i heard somebody say this guy says that show would be far more successful if it had talking animals on it <laughs> and that's it would have been a smash hit rather than just a regular hit if it had talking animals okay now so keep in mind <laughs> Let's keep in mind also the culture of people who, who buy TV shows and TV executives. Yeah, They're not on Twitter. They're not watching this kind of stuff on YouTube. They are immune. <laughs> They're immune to this stuff. 
because they only they only exist in a vacuum where they echo chamber where they hear each other's why didn't we buy that well it didn't have the animation imperative so they only they they don't respond to popular thinking such as what, what what we're discussing here they only they buy things or don't buy things based on what what is said amongst the executives that they go to lunch with um so it's the it is an unfortunate thing it is why but i mean the good thing is there's a much broader tv landscape the bad thing is it's not really resulting in a lot of innovation it's still we're just resulting in more of the same hey just a reminder to leave a like and subscribe if you're still here okay thanks bye Sounds about right in terms of the executives, the people with the money, not really being the ones with the best creative decisions, um, not really understanding that what makes the show successful is, hey, you could have taken your team and, and, and like your animators, your writers, everyone that you had working on Mission Hill, thrown them at any other show and it would have been just as good because it was you guys working on it. It wasn't like it's in that way of like if you took like the Family Guy staff initially, the, the season one Family Guy staff that made Family Guy the big hitter was, I guess it was weird floppy and weird and like that for a while. It got like off the air and stuff, but. Yeah, and then the DVD sales brought it back. It was, yeah, yeah. I mean, that got, that was a stroke of luck, um, you know, that, that that they decided to bring it back because that's so rare in television. Yeah, no, yeah, that one was, I guess that's a funny story in itself, I guess. Yeah, that's what I'm realizing is, hey, I guess I can't even say the early Family Guy staff was that good because they got canceled too. So I think they were good. I mean, and no, they were. They were great. They're they're the people that we look back. It's one of those. I'm yeah. saying to executives, I mean, we look back at them and you know, early Family Guy is revered online as being the better Family Guy because it it stuck to more of a of a normal plot structure. I'm not personally saying that. I I, I watch yeah. all the Family Guy over and just can watch them at any point like with all these adult animated shows but there's some people that say the earlier family guy is better because it had didn't it, it followed like one plot structure throughout the entire episode didn't veer off into mm. a bunch of different storylines as it went on but i don't I, 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 every time i see it i think it's very funny i haven't seen it me too it's like it's like a sketch comedy show as i see it uh like all the cutaway gags i just see it as being like a sketch comedy show because sure like uh the south i know the south park guys always made that joke of like oh it's it doesn't it does they're not making their comedy based off the storyline i'm like oh well it's funny though i mean they're still making right. me laugh the comedy's about making it, me laugh as if it works it works it doesn't right? yeah, exactly. follow a formula um which is yeah anyway so yeah so i'm getting to off the, topic i apologize <laughs> the the it's okay we're we're approaching the end of this saga which is that we that Right now, uh, as I said, Josh and I are trying to pitch the show. It's now Mission Hill. It's now just Mission Hill, Mission Hill Season 2, as I said. Gus and Wally are still far more prominent in the stories of Mission Hill Season 2 than, than they were in the original show. And there'll be some flashback episodes and all that kind of stuff. And there's somewhat changed dynamics between a couple of the characters that we think are going to be really fun. And we are now, like as I said, we've already had three rejections from three of the streaming services, all who said exactly the same thing, that the characters are too old for their demographic. Um, and this is, a, what first we thought like, huh, is it because Gus and Wally are too old? You know, because they're 70. And I'm like, I, to me, that seems like a lot of fun. That, 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 that doesn't, but in fact, it turns out what they're saying is these characters are Generation X because this is a period piece now. They want to attract teenagers to watch the show they don't want to attract 40 year olds to watch the show. Um, and we are, my contention is teenagers are going to want to watch the show. They watched it back when it was on Adult Swim. They loved it then. They're going to love it now because it's going to be a period piece like Happy Days was or that 70s show mm -hmm. was, which yes. were both were immense with teenagers. You show um, them the similarities between the fact that they're Gen Xers and you show right. them the similarities. It's like, sure, we've got different clothing styles and that, but that's not what makes us people. It's it's the way we behave when we're certain ages and how we view the world. And I, I, and, I, I can see that. As you said, you. the show is a, is a, um, as you said, the show doesn't have to, it, it seems like it could have been made yesterday. It doesn't seem like an old show. The character, it doesn't seem dated uh, or whatever, because the things we're dealing with are kind of universal. Yes, there's no iPhones in the show. Uh, yes, there's no, there's no Facebook and there's no, you know, that kind of thing. But otherwise, stories are universal. You know, the stories of Kevin and the stories of Andy and the stories of Gus and Wally, which are already period pieces to begin with, the Gus and Wally stories. So it's like, we, anyway, I'm hoping that one of these places, we only have a few more left, will not have that problem with it. 
I, I really hope that you guys don't, because as, as I've said, I mean, in terms of the demographic, Rick and Morty is not relatable in terms of their age. And Stranger Things is a giant show that takes you back to the 80s. And, and people are liking that of all ages. It's not just older people that were kids in the 80s liking this show that's a relic of the 80s in that way. It's it, it, So I, I think there's a lot, I think there's easily a place for your show to exist on television and we'll get a, a teenagers viewing it. We'll get, I mean, I, I'm in my 20s and I want to view it. So I, I don't, they're, they're weird saying that they think it has to be a right. certain there, age. And, and this is a thing that is often when your TV show, if when you're pitching a TV show and it's rejected, the person is just being polite and, and, and it's just, there's some other reason that they, you know, what you hear is not necessarily the truth. In this case though, since three places all said exactly the same thing, I'm thinking this is, there is something out there th that's causing this. And it's, uh, it may be, it's some of these theories that people hold about animated shows that have tripped us up in the past. So I don't know for sure. Anyway, my fingers are crossed and I'm optimistic that one of the remaining three or four places that we're gonna go to, we'll see the light. Uh, so do you think it would be possible if uh, I, I could help out with my video, if I if I did a call to action of some kind, maybe like a, people love hashtags, we could do hashtag uh, Mission Hill or hashtag Gus and Wally, something like that. Do you think uh, that would? I don't know, because as I just, as I said earlier, these people are impervious to what they don't, they're, they're never going to see it. They're never going to hear it, never going to change any minds because those people do not look at Twitter. They don't follow this kind of stuff. They exist in a vacuum. Um, so would it help? It would certainly make me happy if people were <laughs> to do that. I would love it. Would it help the show get sold? I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, I think we should try anyway. So sure. I'm definitely going to be telling, telling them to do it. I think hashtag Gus and Wally sounds, sounds good. They deserve a hashtag. I, I'm totally in favor of that. And they deserve um, their own show. I mean, more importantly. Yes. But, yes. Uh, uh that that final episode of Mission Hill, I, I want to say it it may it, I it made me cry. I was I was totally not expecting that. I was half I was like watching the show while doing another thing, and then the ending of the episode came up, and I was watching just their whole the whole backstory, the flashback of Gus and Wally meeting, and just as the ending of the episode, the lesson kind of became more and more clear. I was as a creative person myself, I guess I could relate to it, but that was just such a fantastic moral it's a good one story. i really love that dan mcgrath made most of that up and he's it's, it was such a masterpiece that that episode um and i'm i'm so glad that we got to do it and like we as i said we have a couple more episodes we have a really good one for season two where gus it has to do with gus playing on the cosmopolis nfl team in the early 1960s when he when he you know when the nfl was not the, what it is now it's basically just big burly guys drinking beer and playing and playing football and that gus was Back, he had to pretend to be he had to pretend to be straight to play on the Cosmopolis Vultures NFL team in 1962, mm -hmm. and that, that that story kind of comes back uh, today. Uh, it comes back in the modern day. So we have a couple of good stories like that that involve that are kind of similarly patterned to be flashbacks to the earlier years. And I I, lo I love that idea too. I feel like that's such a fun, fresh idea that really gives the the show so many different ways to go with it as well. So yeah, there's that, an infinite number, and also. This is uh, the other thing that was intended with Mission Hill is that Andy was supposed to change jobs every eight episodes, mm -hmm. approximately, and that he would eventually rise after a, a, a very hard, long struggle. He would eventually achieve success in the later seasons and become basically a Matt Groening type who would have his own animated show and would, would finally be recognized that Matt Groening was for his, for his comics, you know, in the LA Weekly and things like that, that Andy would eventually follow that same path. Um, and so anyway... We're also going to get to see Andy's next job in season two. The ad agency thing doesn't work out in a funny way, <laughs> which I hope you'll be seeing. Um, and that he goes on to his next job and, you know, he gradually works his way up um, the ladder. The, the episode two, a guy, I love that part. That's going to live rent free in my head. Just uh, Jim, Brian Posen, just doing his. Uh, the work to, in order to get Andy the job. Yeah, just slowly. I love just, that. That was so barely. hilarious. Ah, mm, I love that guy, David Clennon, too. I was like, people don't get this, but nobody under 50 is going to get this. But that guy, that's from the show 30 something, which I think we mentioned. That, like, was some of the 
30 something was a very entertaining show that was on the late 80s early 90s and there was a brief period when the guys started the show worked at an advertising agency run by this incredibly self-involved guy uh played by david clennon we got david clennon to play jim's boss and basically do exactly the same role and um i love it oh my god if you've read the script for super tool the super tool was episode 15 i think I, I, was I wasn't able ad- to find the scripts anywhere. I couldn't find links to them. That was the only thing oh, I I'll couldn't send it to find. you. Please, this, yeah. I, I was able to find the animatics, down. just not the link, or not the scripts. Um, I'll send it to you. I think it's still Thank online. You. A guy, a fan, made this made this site literally 20 years ago, and it's still operate. It's possible that it finally got taken down. But um, anyway, that's the best. That one is the advertising agency episode, and it's got a ton of that kind of stuff in it. It's very entertaining. Oh, that's really exciting to hear. I'm so, I'm just excited to read those scripts now, but I, uh, I was really impressed with when I watched the animatics too, like you said, it, uh, seeing um, Gwen and Andy's relationship uh, evolving more with uh, the, the whole pink eye bit. I thought that was yes. really creative and fun. That was clever. And that uh, takes place in season two that had, there's even more Andy and Gwen in season two. Um, that their, their relationship takes a couple steps forward in some unexpected ways. Oh yeah, because yeah, that's one of the funniest things. They don't really ever get closure in season one, did they? No. It was kind of like a weird because I mean, you guys were expecting to make more. You guys were literally working on five episodes. You thought we'll continue it in these episodes. You oh didn't yeah, need I mean, to Gwen close was it out intended, in the season finale. When was intended to stay around for yeah. forever. Yeah, you know, but they would be on and off. I mean, it wouldn't be a. It wouldn't be a. It wouldn't be exactly a tranquil relationship between the two of them, but it would be on and off. Um, and so, yeah, she's there's a, a, a lot of her in season two. And hopefully we can get Jane Wheatland, Jane Wheatland back to do her. Oh, yeah. We, she was... um... Excellent. The whole the whole voice cast was really great. It has such such a unique sound to everyone. Um yeah, I was it's one of those shows where I'm just like, yeah, you can hear everyone caring about every line delivery so yes and that's also and it's spongebob's first the oh, first use of the spongebob Jimmy briskin voice. yeah Jimmy briskin is, is, is spongebob it was the, the tom kenny was just working up that voice and you can it's funny now to see it because you're like that guy's talking like spongebob but that was jimmy briskin was before spongebob did you guys hear it and think that's oh that's gonna a good voice you should do that for an audition soon and tom kenny's like oh yeah i got this one coming uh, no we, i don't think, <laughs> i don't think it was ever discussed it was only years later we realized ah. i think somebody else pointed it out too that we were that, that it was i guess yeah thing. it's just a little extra voice it's not something you would have paid too much attention to at the time right just, right oh, okay that's funny that's yeah i thought I, I agree i caught i caught it at the time when i was watching the show and then you guys bring it up all the time. I'm like, good, everyone else noticed it too. It's totally that's, the, leg- that's the most successful legacy of the show is that SpongeBob original SpongeBob voice originally appeared on it. That's yep. the, it's claim to fame. Uh, he, even though he does a fantastic job as uh, Wally as well. Oh my god, know, yes! I cannot wait to get those guys back in the recording studio. Oh. Um, I'm ho- and again, fingers crossed that that happens. Yeah, really. Um, I want to talk about more more staff members because. Um, I guess these people deserve recognition too. They're, I feel like they're all unsung heroes and all that. So um, first, I'm just curious, how, how did you go about, because I just don't know how shows run. How do you go about like finding a staff for a show? Like how do you pick the writers and the, and the animators? Is it like a normal thing where you're sending in resumes? Do you just kind of already know these connections or uh, how, how does that work? Well, it all began with Lauren McMullen, who we had been friends with from college and she had been you know, a successful animator. Prior to this, and we got her, she were like, would you like to, to work on the show with us? Will you help us? This, will you design the characters and the whole look of the show? Um, and she did. She had, she hired all those people. It, it, she was entirely, it was entirely her department, all the wow. animation, everything. It was, she didn't, we had no, no involvement in that other than just saying, that sounds great. Um, as far as the writers, some of them we had worked with in the past. Um, and some of them we uh, found from just the way that you hire writers, which is by reading sample material. Um, we read hundreds of sample scripts, uh, and we hired, you know, we tried to hire a mixture of different types of people with different backgrounds, um, from, uh, for based on their sample scripts and also that they had the kind of, they had the right vibe. We didn't want people who had a lot of, you know, we didn't have a lot of people that had sitcom, regular sitcom experience. They came from other backgrounds and from other, um, types of writing, um, and so like Robin Stein, for instance, was a reporter, 
although she had written a great spec script but before that she had been a reporter for I think for the AP or UPI um, and uh, you know so we just had a lot of different people with voices Michael Paines was a very valuable writer we had seen him on Austin stories Austin stories with people nobody remembers anymore was a show on MTV which I thought was hysterical and was one one of the main inspirations for Mission Hill because Josh and I loved it um, in fact, the guy who created it ended up working next door to us uh, at Castle Rock. And it was, it's very, if you see it, you're going to get, you know, you can see it on YouTube, I'm sure. This is a mission, has a very Mission Hill vibe to it. And it's, it was people in Austin, Texas, kind of hipsters back in Austin, Texas. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. I'm, I'm from Houston, Texas. So I, I have you ever seen Austin They're stories? my hipster neighbors. I'm not. Have you no. ever seen the show? No. It's I fun. Anyway, so Michael Payne's, we got from Austin stories. And, and, and he was, he really provided a great, we had a number, yeah, we had a, a, a really good staff. Um, Aaron Ehas, who's gone on to great success. Um, Andrew Kreisberg in his first job before he went on to yeah. all that success. And then that controversy. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it was a good, it was a good group. Uh, and then uh, I, uh, about Lauren McMullen, because obviously you guys, you even pay her a lot of credit with um, the, the logo, um, the, uh, what is it? Uh, Oakley or the W O M. Um, yes. We wanted to have that, you know, cause taking a cue from Matt Groening, who has a signature had the most amazing deal in television history where his signature appears on everything <laughs> that it has to do with the Simpsons. Oh. Like we were like, well, we want that too, but we want all of our names. So it was W O M. And she designed that little logo for W O M, which did. I, I, again, I thought stuff. that was such a just classy move from you guys. Cause it, it was, you two were the creators not in Lauren. So it's one of those things where you guys could have always just kind of said, oh, we're going to, well, we're, we're just going to have our initials. The, you, you included her we, in that. We could have such, done that. It was such a, it was important it showed that you were really paying her, respects to your employees. Her visual, she gave the show its visual life, which is a huge, important part of it. And we didn't want to take that, uh, you know, we wanted her to get full credit for that. Um, so yeah, no, that was a big, that was a, a big part of it. Um, and her her vision for the way the show looked and stuff that, that made it so unique. No, oh, it's a fantastic. I, I asked a poll on my um, on my YouTube. We have like there's like a community tab thing where I can ask a question, and I, I asked people if they had any questions for a creator of Mission Hill, and so many of them were about the art design and just saying how fantastic it was, where they got the ideas and inspiration. It's so amazing. A lot of love went to the art department, so I knew I knew that was Lauren. Just yeah. my well, this... knowing my history, so I wanted to ask plenty about her. I should say that the the what we were going for and what Lauren achieved mar marvelously was a look was an alternative comic book vibe. Like this is also probably unknown to people under thirty, but there was a huge boom of alternative comic books in the nineties. Um, and by alternative comic books, I mean comic books that were fairly. They were kind of it was a descendant of the underground comics of the seventies. Uh, that the alternative comics were were for the most part realistic. Um, and they were about their story, a lot of stories of people in their 20s, in their teens and 20s. And the, some of the most, um, some of the most famous ones were Eight Ball by Daniel Klaus, uh, Optic Nerve by Adrian Tomine, and Hate, which was also known as Buddy Bradley by Peter Bagg. Um, and all of those were inspirations for this. And that's why the show has, the color design is supposed to look like it was printed and slightly misregistered. Um, of the backgrounds, which is why the colors are always a little bit off in the backgrounds mm -hmm. because it's supposed to look like it was printed cheaply. Um, so that combined with Lauren's own personal style, um, that was where the that was where the look came from. It was supposed to look like one of those comic books. Wow, yeah, it's I yeah exactly. It's like you're the animation. It's it felt like um it felt like King of the Hill with 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 cartoony with cartoony aesthetic at times, like uh -huh. breaks of cartooniness. And I, and that's, that's why I, I could tell it was comic and style. Like you guys meant for it to feel like normal humans with occasional outbursts of crazy, uh, yeah. wild. And it also I really owes enjoyed it. A somewhat. I, and I know Lauren has acknowledged this. It owes a little bit to Harvey Kurtzman, who was, you know, the founder of mad. And he was the, he was one of the most seminal cartoonists, right? Cartoonists and writers of the 20th century. Um, and it, it definitely, some of the Mission Hill stuff really looks like Harvey Kurtzman drew it. Um, and, and that's part of the inspiration as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was the, there was even a mad cartoon for a little bit on Cartoon Network, actually. Uh, oh, yeah. Around, yeah. yeah. Around my, my time of like being in high school, I was like 
seeing that there. I, I enjoyed it too. It was funny. I, I got it. It was, that's why whenever you brought it up, I was like, Oh, okay. I do kind of see that in the, mm -hmm. in, uh, in mission Hill. Um, Oh, I wanted to ask how, how, how you met Lauren, uh, I guess, or which, which one of you, cause you and you and Josh weren't going to the same college. Right. Right. I, so, I went to, I was on the, I went to Harvard and it was on the Harvard then yeah. spent all my time. That's why I wanted to go to Harvard because I knew I wanted to be involved in comedy writing magazines. This is back when comedy magazines were in existence, like national lampoon. Mm -hmm. And so the Harvard lampoon is where that came from. Um, and I was lucky enough to get on the staff um, right away and with other people who have since gone on to great success at TV, like David X Cohen, and Paul Sims also who were all in my class. Uh, Lauren was on the Harvard Lampoon magazine and was, we had a lot of talented artists in those days, but she was possibly the most talented. Um, and she was all, well, we did, she just did incredible work. And so we had, I don't think we'd ever actually worked with her on any projects. We, we were friends socially, but I don't think we'd actually ever worked with her until Mission Hill. Just kind of, you just kind of knew damn that girl is talented we need to if we ever can we should use her skills she absolutely a, and she i think this was right around the time that she had uh been directing king of the hill episodes and other things so she was definitely she knew how the oh, she knew how okay. the how, how the process worked and she was capable of running the whole staff very cool i was yeah i wanted to know more about her just because she seemed like a very integral part of the show so she was someone who's who doesn't have the most uh not uh, like information online and i felt like oh she's such a impressive talent i'm like well she must have she must have done more so yeah if she's worked on king of the hill episodes and stuff it oh really i mean shows. and since then i'm sure you know she's gone on to immense success she was um, oscar nominated you oh. know she's directed dozens of she's directed dozens of episodes of tv she and then she went on to disney and she was nominated for an academy award for, for, for which for which one it was the short it was the short that was on the front of the movie frozen was that one where Mickey Mouse, it was, it, it was like the old Mickey Mouse comes into the present day and vice versa. He comes out of the screen. Yeah. You know what I'm talking yeah. about? That mm -hmm. was her. Yes. Okay. That was her idea. And she animated it and it got, a, 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 she didn't win the Academy Award, but she got nominated. Yeah, I know. It. Yeah. And she's like, she has like, she just has an immense amount of talent and, and continued success. She's very in demand in the animation world. Um, but and she's always coming up with something new and cool. You guys had an eye for talent. You noticed that. Yeah, I think so. Way but back we when. I, her talent was visible to 20 years before <laughs> we, we got to work with her at Mission Hill. <laughs> I'm sure it was. She, she's obviously highly talented. I, again, I really hope you guys get to continue to work with her. Yeah. Uh, now, let's see. Um, asking about uh, Josh, how, how did you, uh, you and Josh Weinstein, um, how did you guys start working together how did you guys say i want to start writing instead of writing alone let's let's write together how does that start um it started in ninth grade we met in ninth grade um and we had similar senses of humor because there's not a very funny school that we went to and we uh, decided we both worked on the newspaper we both had a desire we both were into publications particularly things like mad magazine and national lampoon and we decided uh, that I, I decided I was going to start a humor magazine at the high school and asked Josh to do it with me. And he did actually, he did a large, he did most of the writing. I did a lot of the art and stuff. This was back when I was, I started out as a cartoonist. And so I did a lot of the art and the layout and the design of the magazine. He did a ton of the writing and we just, we worked really well together. And then we went to separate colleges, but he, but he, um, he became an honorary member of the Lampoon. And so he worked with us on some other projects. And then we decided to like, we decided to give it a shot because we had other people we had knew, older people had gotten uh, hired at Letterman or Saturday Night Live. And we thought we would give that a shot. And we didn't get hired any of those places. Yeah. And we had a kind of crummy four year period until we finally uh, got our big break. Okay, very interesting. Yeah, just because um, you know, writing as a process can just be something where if you're not clicking with someone, it's like, oh, I really don't want to write with this person. So it's very, it's oh, very yeah. interesting to find it's very fun. a duo like you that's that have gone out of your way to really work on so many projects together. It, it, it's extremely fun to work with a writing partner when you guys, when you get along well. Uh, the one drawback, which is what on, ends up causing people to lose their partnerships is because you have to split the money. Um, you don't, so it's not, they're not paying you two salaries. 
you're getting one salary and you got to split it. And as, as you get older and you start having a family and kids and crap, it becomes annoying that you're making, a, because when you divide it in half, you're making less than almost everyone else on the staff, um, which becomes really annoying at a certain point. I, I, I don't want to ask too much about the, the Simpsons, just because there's a lot of Simpsons information. I want to stick to Mission, Mission Hill. But um, I do want to ask, just because I know this is how you got on The Simpsons, was that you guys replaced two other writers that were leaving The Simpsons. Was that like the case there where you guys were still sharing a salary or did, because you were taking over for two people, were they sharing a salary and you took over sharing? The, no, I'm that's the standard that thing. That's a standard thing in TV. In, in, in Having regular a writing, TV. writing partner? You always, that's what it is. You split it. It's a partner, partnership. You have to split the salary. Um, except, and so that's, at least the last time I checked, they don't allow partnerships on, on variety shows like SNL or Letterman because mm-hmm. you got to pay the people two salaries. But on regular sitcoms or dramas, you, you split one salary. And so we, uh, they did. Those guys, Jay and Wally, Jake Hogan and Wally Waldarski, we didn't really replace them because they were far more senior than we were. Or yeah, you're not we replacing started. them. No, we, I just we got their office. Filling the void. Filling the void yeah, is what we, I meant. We of got course, the yeah. office that had two desks in it. Yes. Um, and that was what happened. So yeah, we did it. We were hired as a team. We worked as a team continuously from then until about 2007. Um, and uh, where, when we started to, even during that time, we were like, we got to get separate salaries. We got to get separate contracts because this splitting a salary thing is just not working. It, I want I want to ask a little bit about that if you don't mind, because um, I know that it was specifically the the show "Sit Down, Shut Up," which hilariously I remember that premiering on Fox whenever I was with my dad and was watching it and just being like, "Oh, this is a show," and it just did not uh-huh. last that long. <laughs> it was like, "Yeah, okay." So I I, I know that was the show that uh, I guess is where these contractual uh, is, is is as it was put on wikipedia it was like contractual negotiations were kind of like we created this a little feud or an argument or something and um and i know the writer's strike was going on at the time uh was it just was that just simply it though that you guys were just like oh i just kind of want to make my own salary i just think i just think now is a pretty good time it wasn't, it wasn't anything more than that. No, I, no, it was, Wikipedia it was, it made it, was, it seem it was, like something. It was complicated. It was kind of a union issue at the time. Like this is in its, it's complicated because at that time, primetime animated shows. And by me, this whole thing is different now because there's no such thing as primetime anymore on a streaming service. But at the time, primetime animated shows, including Mission Hill, had all been Writers Guild. And it was a hugely fought battle to have Simpsons went on strike. Mission Hill went on strike before it even got started. Uh, King of the Hill and all those things wanted to, they were covered by the Writers Guild. Sit down, shut up. They told us it was going to be covered by the Writers Guild. And then they later said, oh, it's not going to be covered by the Writers Guild. And so there was a strike on that show too. And eventually they found a way to make it work and still have the show not be Writers Guild. Um, And I did not go back and Josh did. Um, However, like anyway, the show was already, the show was basically canceled to begin with. So yeah. <laughs> like it was, that was kind of a thing, but like, and even now these days it's even harder because like the writer's guild thing, the writer's guild would like to cover all these shows, but it's, I could go on for an hour about this. It's too boring for the average, for the yeah, average no, person. I, 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 yeah, I know but, I'm more interested in it than the average person too. So I apologize, but some shows are covered by the writer's guild. Others are not. And it's a big mess because every time you get into this area, it's, it's this it's, it's conflict between the Writers Guild and IATSE. IATSE covers the Motion Picture Screen Cartoonists Union. And so, because sometimes writers, right, until The Simpsons, most animated shows were written, the people did, who storyboarded them also wrote them. And so like, it wasn't the clear, they didn't have the demarcation between writers and artists. And so that those people are covered by the Motion Picture Screen Cartoonists, but now it's different. And the writers, so writers on shows on many shows are not covered by the Writers Guild and they don't get residuals. The script fee is very low. You know, you get $8,000 as opposed to $33,000 for your script and you don't get any residuals, which is unbelievable for shows that we run. So yeah, this is a, it's an issue that continually comes up and I hope it will be resolved sometime, but I've been, it's been a thorny issue for 30 years and it's not getting any better. Anyway, that's right. the sidebar well, on that topic. No, yeah, I appreciate it. I, I I wanted to know. I was curious. It was literally one of the questions I had in here. I was very curious just about that little stint in history. So I appreciate you um, expounding upon that. Um, let's see. What do I got here next? Uh, here's a fun one. 
Do you think you're more of an Andy or a Kevin? I like to think of myself more as an Andy. <laughs> I think that I am a more Andy. I definitely have Andy's cranky, stubborn side. <laughs> that's for sure. Oh, good. You know, <laughs> that's that's the Andy, the sour, the kind of crabby, <laughs> sour puss Andy. Um, uh, and but I, I think yeah, I do. That's if we write it. We, I do recall, like I have some of his naivete and some of his stubbornness. Um, and I think that I am like, but I do have Kevin's enthusiasm for things. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag, uh, but I like to think of myself more as an, as an anti yeah. guess. Okay, I like that answer. Uh, again, into in the writing, because I'm, I'm into I'm into that sort of thing. Um, were there any story Bible rules that you guys had for Mission Hill? Sometimes we hear uh, from other shows, like uh, ones is that there was like a SpongeBob. It had the creator had like three rules he had for the show that the people were to never break. Was there any any kind of rule or something that your show you thought, no, this thing can never change? Or I, I want to make sure we always have this in mind. I don't That's think a weird so. Question. I you know I don't. We did certainly didn't have any rules that were written down. I, we did have a we wanted the show to be realistic in most cases and but it was all kind of just tone issues that we had i don't believe we had any specific rules um of that nature it's very clear what the show is if you've watched a minute of the show or read the first script it's very clear what the show is and i think people in general you know we didn't have talking animals or things like that <laughs> but other than that it was pretty clear uh, i don't think it was hard for the writers to understand what we had in mind sure i guess that's the point too is yeah you're working with a close knit enough staff that you really don't need to set out that sort of uh, uh right, rule right. set. Um do you have a favorite joke from the show? There are a lot of jokes. You know, my favorite episode is definitely the advertising agency is part two, yes. is unemployment part two, where Andy gets the job. I the, all that stuff with Beardly, I think my favorite joke is probably don't forget your tooth. <laughs> and that one is all that stuff with Andy and the tooth, the piece of styrofoam coffee cup, where he has that as his tooth and he has that interview. Also during that part where Gus and Wally, what Gus is is mad that Wally's lying on the phone and being like, lying is wrong hearted. And he grabs the phone. And yeah. that, that, I think that sequence, everything from Andy getting on the subway with this missing tooth and, and that cup. <laughs> also when he goes to the, that whole episode is a little stuff like that, when he goes to the dentist and they're like, he doesn't know what his profession is. He doesn't know what his job is. Yeah. And he runs away. And like, there's a, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff on there I like. And I, I, honestly, probably it's all the whole Beardly stuff, the whole job interview is probably my favorite thing ever on Mission Hill. Okay. That was a, yeah, I like that answer. That's a, I also yeah. like all the stuff in the previous episode from the, the like Scunch, all those funny things that, that they buy, at, that they get from the dumpster at the 66 cent store. <laughs> yeah, whatever yeah, it is. yeah including the one that has a dog on it, it has this cyrillic lettering. It's like, yeah. this dog, this, you think this is dog food? It's got a picture of a dog on it. And then you see Stogie yeah. looking really sick. He knows it's a ground up dog. And yeah. Uh, it's, uh, when, something I liked about the jokes in your show is that I guess watching it back, especially with an adult animated show where you kind of, you can go risque and go kind of try to push the envelope there was not a lot of times in the show where I felt like, oh, this show couldn't be made nowadays. That's what everyone likes to say online. This show can, you know, like, because it, it, it was too risque or something. It was doing something that would be considered uh, canceled now. And I really didn't, I didn't catch that a lot in your show. It was very, um, it, you guys pulled a lot of your humor from just uh, kind of just observational humor off the hipster type of person it was it was it was a show that aged well i was i, th I felt your comedy well, you. just was very respectable thank you it's not thank even you. Oh, i remember one other thing that i love ways. the thing i love the thing um from the unfinished episode from the crud wagon episode the whole part where jim's freaking out when jim's freaking out in the in at the chicken dipsies when he's like i just want my chicken dipsies i just need my chicken dipsies yeah. grandma's probably sitting up late worrying about us i just need chicken dipsies so i can think state sanctioned indian gambling drinking girls can't decide anything without some chicken dipsies sunflowers make you feel free i just need chicken dipsies he has a huge fit in in that rest in the fast food restaurant because he wants his chicken dipsies and people are nagging him. It's like, that's, it's so funny. It that's like where the animatic ends too. And it's so perfect. Yeah. I just want my chicken dips. 
and then it's just end. It was, it was like that's that was. The I best think that actually there is more to that scene. <laughs> of that course, he, of course. He had a big. He did have a fit and had to be carried out of the restaurant. Or I don't remember what it was, but that's. I love that sequence. I, yeah, I love it too. I think Brian Posen's performance was as Jim yeah. is so so wonderful. He doesn't. He hasn't done a whole bunch of voice acting, but I think you guys utilized his voice the best because it was just such a him character it really was just him yeah i think i agree yeah it's uh going all day about all the voice actors i liked oh uh, i guess one funny story i will tell you really quick about myself that i've once i tweeted at scott scott menville i think he made a tweet or something about mission hill and i just said something pretty like lightly positive and then just went penis 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 <laughs> <laughs> and he and he liked it's it i was like thank god most... he liked it or else i would have just been he just doesn't remember the joke and is like what's this guy doing saying penis to me i'm sure he remembers that it's the most it is the one thing that has crossed over to the main to somewhat of the mainstream as it became a meme uh and and um it's the most quoted thing <laughs> from mission hill by far How'd you guys come up with that? Just saying penis five times. It would not. <laughs> it was, I, I love it. The the, it was the only thing we could get away with. That was, that was it, it, they let us, they were very generous with the censorship. I mean, like that stuff, that was pushing it on broadcast TV. And the whole episode with Kevin and the masturbation episode, like that was pushing it as well. Like that was definitely the frontier of what you're able to get away with on broadcast TV mm -hmm. in 1999. How you guys danced around the censors with the manipulating or myself? That was yeah, that was brilliant. They they said you can only say masturbation like six times in in the episode, and so they did. That was the one episode where the, the censor was like, "This is just too much, guys," and so we had to use euphemisms for but it. Again, yeah, it's like you uh, you mentioned it. It's like it fits it fits Kevin though. Yeah, he wouldn't does. be saying, "Oh, I was I was masturbating." He'd be saying, "I was manipulating myself." Uh -huh. So it fit. It just it, you you made it work. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, ah, here's a funny one uh, about casting. Um, yeah, it's perfect. Didn't I noticed Newsweek was like a, a a trend in a in a couple of the actors like resume. Like they were, um, you just had a quite a few of the actors were on Newsweek. Where it was Newsweek, something you guys are aware of. And you guys wait, news radio. Or news radio, news radio. Yes, news radio. God, I'm so dumb sometimes. Newsweek. I don't know. Yes, sorry, news radio. Newsweek. Yes, that's our friend's show. Paul Sims. Remember how I said Paul Sims was on the uh, was on the Lampoon with with us. Paul Sims is one of my good friends. He yeah. created the show News Radio. Okay. And he uh, has since gone on to work on many other shows. You know, he was in Larry Sanders uh, and uh, and Atlanta, and now he is the showrunner of What We Do in the Shadows. Uh, but news radio was his show. So yeah, we are, it is definitely a, a thing like that. And I know Andy Dick from News Radio was also auditioned and got all the way to the very end for the voice of Kevin. Yeah, I could, yeah, no, I could see him being a high contender for Kevin. I mean, he looks, yeah. he looks like a grown up Kevin, so it fits. He did a good job. No, yeah, he would. Um, that's, yeah, it's really cool. I, I thought, I thought that was going to be something that you, you guys are aware of because it was just like, what is it? Four of the cast members had uh news radio credit are you guys ready for the most awkward interview question in the video oh, okay i really thought about cutting this one out but you know that wouldn't be as funny so <sighs> i'll get better at this i swear so uh, you were a supervising producer on futurama what exactly was that jo job i know this is a weird one but i'm just curious i think, I that, was exactly what a I think that was josh i think that was josh i was consulting producer consulting um, producer jo yeah josh okay and what's, I were just, what's we that for anyway? one season it's just a guy who only comes in a couple of days a week. <laughs> in it, it no, that's all I want to know. I was just curious what what that was. What consulting that kind producer of is what you give to someone who only comes in, who does the same job as the rest of the writers, but only comes in a couple of days a week. Josh and I came in two or three days a week during. I think it was the yeah. No, I'm talking about that 2001 early Futurama. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. about that. I, mean, I meant show. consulting producer. That yeah, it's a fun show. Basically, all we did was we sat in the room and and contributed contributed jokes and. Story okay so it's just kind of like, like a part-time kind of or not part-time yeah. but you know what i mean like yeah partial hours not as much of it okay okay that yeah. was interesting i was just curious what that sure. that job it stuck out there like oh what, what is that if they didn't write i was curious what that was um i want to get into uh let's see i'm going to ask some questions here from my audience i've got questions pulled Great. up um because we had 
a lot of people requesting that I do this video on Mission Hill. A lot of people were very excited and had a bunch of interesting questions. I didn't want to answer them myself, so I wanted to give them, or I didn't want to ask them myself. I wanted to give them credit, so. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, and my phone is being weird. Oh, oh no, hold on. Okay, there we go. Uh, talked about the canceled episodes a bit. Let's go into, ah, uh, given that the, sh uh, uh, George Castan uh, Castaneda says, uh, given that the show had a lot of ska references, was ska music a big influence in the creative process? No, <laughs> it was not. Uh, it was, there was a reference, like, I should say also that Josh is the music guy. Josh knows so much about music and all these bands and stuff. I do not know anything about it. So he did most of the, <laughs> he and the, we had Sean Peterson, who was also our music supervisor, who would often find all these kind of somewhat obscure alternative and indie bands from those days. So basically like in answer to, as far as I know, it was not, there was just a joke. It was just a, it, because it worked well as a joke for Kevin to not know what Scott was. Yes, yeah, yeah. Obsessed with it. it was not a, it was not a huge deal, but um, it, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a, it wasn't a major part of the show, but it was something that we liked, especially Josh, definitely into that whole, he was definitely into the indie music scene at that time, and I think he still is. Okay, cool. It's a fun one, yeah. Um, uh, we talked about the network, uh, backgrounds, uh, kind of said which episode is your favorite, I feel like with uh, the un unemployment, yeah, unemployment part two. Part two yeah. Um, uh, how about uh, what's your favorite animated show or movie outside of the own things you've worked on? I, I think I've heard you answer this before, but maybe you've got some new ones to add to the list. Yeah, it's Robot Chicken. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it is. It, it, I mean, like, I, I also like Bob's Burgers. I like all those other shows. I like Rick and Morty. Um, but the only show that I watch for entertainment that's an animated show uh, is Robot Chicken, which always makes me laugh. I love the way, it's like the, the way that it's animated I think it's, just, I don't know, the, the combination of the writing and the way that the stuff looks when animated, it cracks me up. So that's like the show that I watch. And it's still, they're still making new ones, I think, or the last season just came out recently. Anyway, that is the one animated show that I really like a lot. Yeah, because um, they're one of the few sketch comedy shows that'll take, they'll reference something from the 70s and then go back and just, all right, now we're going to make a really modern reference to something right now. It's like they just go And all, sometimes all they're not the even board. references. I mean, I like the, oh, yeah, yeah, like no, the sketch comedy really stuff. Original. You know, there's a lot of really funny lines on that show. Um, what else can I? There's, um, the, and I like Bob's Burgers every time I see it. Like I'd say the other the shows that I the only show that I seek out uh, to watch is is that is Robot Chicken. Very nice. No, that's not a bad answer at all. I like to hear I like to hear some validation for for Robot Chicken. It's not one I hear a lot of people uh, throw out. So that's a good one. Uh, thank you. Uh, Here's a vague one, and maybe you'll give us something different for this answer. Uh, sorry, not sorry. Asks, what was your favorite part about working on the show? So there was there a favorite part, or I guess was it just the whole experience of it being such a pleasant time and just that whole work environment? Yeah, it, but I think it, it's it's the my favorite part honestly was the table reads and then going out to fancy dinner, taking everyone out to fancy <laughs> dinner. That was an amazing like the experience of working on the show was relentlessly excellent from the day they ordered it until the day that it got canned. Well, the day that things started to fall apart, which is that upfronts in 1999. Um, but like that, like, it, it, I think the, I loved working with the people. I love working with the actors. I love seeing what Lauren and the team would come up with, you know, for designs and stuff. There was all of that stuff was so, and I like creating the world, creating the world of Mission Hill with all those fake advertisements that were written, some of them were written by the writers, many of them were come up with by the animators and the whole world of the, I like the fakes, I like the boat cola and the maestro uh, malt liquor and all these other fake products that we came up with um, that like populate the world, um, I find to be delightful. That uh, other shows would usually take like two seasons or three seasons. Oh, maybe we should start having like a, a beer brand they drink. I say, you know, that's, uh, maybe we should start establishing that. You guys had it right from the get go. We, we made the writers work on that stuff for, for weeks before we even started. Like I want the names of the streets, like the names of the streets in the Mission Hill District are all like sound real, like the, they're like Lower East Side streets, like Turpentine Street, Barrel Street. They're all just like old time reference. Like we know all the streets. And the one, I, 
this never got on the air, but like there's a long list of streets that made that were very, very believable, but funny to me. Um, one of which <laughs> are places or landmarks in Cosmopolis, one of which was the Ronald Reagan Skywalk. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Paints came up with that, which still <laughs> makes me laugh to this day. I think about the Ronald Reagan Skywalk. 100% believable that a city would have a Ronald Reagan Skywalk, but yeah. it just seems so dumb in a certain type of way. Anyway, that's one of the things that I like best, actually, is the it, Ronald Reagan Skywalk. I love that about the humor is because it's it's it doesn't slap you in the face like, haha, get it? So it's one of those things where if you get it, you can laugh at it. And if you don't, it's like, it's fine because it can also just breeze by and not have to wait for you to laugh at you. Be like, all right, I didn't, I didn't laugh though. It's like a lot of the humor, you throw stuff in the backgrounds and just let it, let it be. And it's- That, that was also the name of the ad agency. Like we, we spent a lot of time coming up with the name of the advertising agency, which is not funny. It's just believable in the way that advertising agencies have these tortured names because they're combined, like TW, PBWA, Chiate, or whatever. They all have these. And so we were like, made the writers come up with advertising agencies. And some of the writers erred on the side of making them too funny. Whereas Aaron has came up with Enderman Hatano HGEE Creative, which just sounds like a tortured mixture of names and stuff or whatever. And that's what it's called. Um, and like, for some reason, that also. It, it's not amusing to probably anyone else, but to me, it's like, that's perfect. Mm -hmm. And, but you never had to have a little scene of Jim going, Oh, it's called this. Oh, why is no, it, it just appears this? in the background? Oh yeah. There was a crazy murder. You didn't have to explain the joke or have it really be called out. You just let it sit. And it's exactly, Oh, did anyone get it? I don't know. We made it. For right. And it wasn't It'll even really funny. a joke to speak of, but it's a very accurate satirical jab at weird advertising agency names. <laughs> That's, I mean, I feel like it's that, it's that kind of niche observational humor, though, that really resonates with people. And they do, yeah, that is a weird thing over there. It doesn't always have to be the most r highly relatable thing. People can um, enjoy right. observations from other people's perspectives. So I, I, think it, I, I think that's the kind of humor <laughs> I just can't wait to see more of. Uh, speaking of which, were Gus and Wally based on anyone in you or Josh's real life? Were they? No. They were actually based on a, this is an interesting sidelight of Gus and Wally, that you know how Mo and the Simpsons came from the two bar tape, that you guys, have you ever discussed this, that even the character of Mo the bartender, mm -hmm. and the fact that he gets these prank calls, that came from a an underground tape that was going around in the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of any of this stuff? No. Okay, no, so the, so people the, back in the back in the day, <laughs> in the real real primitive day, there was a people would exchange cassette tapes of funny bloopers and crap like this, right? Mm -hmm. One of the tapes was called the Tube Bar Tape, and it was a guy who was a bartender who had a really gruff voice. People would prank call him all day and say like, "I want to speak to you know, <laughs> I want can I speak to a funny." name like i want to kiss i want to kiss or whatever right mm -hmm. and the guy would get really mad he'd be like i'm gonna break your head he, 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 was, he had a deep voice like gus and we were like let's do let's have gus and wally do that and there's another tape called mm -hmm. shut up little man that was around around that time and it was it's a recording of these of two guys are two, their roommates and i think they were lovers uh arguing and they argued a lot and someone else made a tape of this um which is also going around and gus and wally is based on that because the guys would just shout at each other and we were like okay let's make one of those guys lawrence tierney lawrence tierney is the guy um is the guy the bald guy that we had on the simpsons who was a, a, a really tough old grizzled actor who was basically like that so it's going to be gus it's going to be him uh him uh lawrence tierney and Wally Cox. Wally Cox, nobody remembers him, but he was kind of, he looks like Wally. That's why he's called Wally, was an actor, comic actor in the 50s and 60s. So that's where the, that all came from. And their dynamic came from the tape, the Shut Up Little Man tape. Wow, that is a, uh, yeah, quite Deep a bit of history. That's <laughs> you didn't expect that much history. No, but I, li no, but I liked that. I, I, I didn't, yeah, I wasn't aware of any of that. So thank you. That's all interesting. Sure. Um, Okay, I'm bringing up this question just because I thought it was funny because I've heard you say that at some point you guys got sent a fan spec script of Mission Hill that you liked that was like a Halloween special. And I got a comment here that says, 
ask if there's any plans to revive the show, even if it's just for YouTube, even if it's just for one Halloween special. I'd like to think it's the guy who wrote you the spec script and uh-huh. is just like trying to get, he's like, when are they making my script? I sent it to them. Uh-huh. <laughs> I just wanted to say that one just made me laugh. I'm like, what is the, what is a weird coincidence? They'd ask for a Halloween special and you guys were like, we were sent a Halloween spec script. It's a, a huge treat to read an episode of Mission Hill that someone else has come up with. Like, that just like, it's exciting to see stuff happen. I'm a fan of Mission Hill, and that's why I want to see more episodes. And if somebody else writes it, all the better. Oh, yeah, right. That's, I know, it sounds like almost a fun writing project for myself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I really liked Mission Hill, and I mean, you guys have a lot of uh, experience with spec scripts on your own, so I'm sure that was pretty cool getting to yeah, very. Be, be on the receiving end. And I love the, I see, I see the fan art, too. Occasionally, people have been people still do every couple of months. I oh, find yeah. Mission Hill fan art that I love and people like make Gus and Wally like avatars for um, Animal Crossing. And they there's like uh, people, there's mm-hmm. people doing Mission Hill, uh, you know, custom art, custom art, like they'll design you as a Mission Hill character, all that stuff. I love it. Oh, that's so funny. That's really cool. I, I really hope there gets to be more attention towards Mission Hill because it is one of those shows that people could could revive in that way like a uh, uh, one thing that i know was memed a bit or at least it popped up in the in the little gifts that you can search for was posey holding the welcome to the real world sucker sign <laughs> like, oh, that's that gets a used a fair reaction online. yeah it's a good one <laughs> uh, she was a great character i thought you're writing for posey i i remember going into the show thinking oh posey's probably going to be one of the characters i'm not liking as much she's probably going to be kind of her shtick's going to get old for me and the way you wrote her though it's like nope she isn't just this perfect flower girl too she oh i want to sell my she plants has a now hidden, and so she has a hidden dark side she's ambitious yes i love she's it she's ruthless and she has a lot of uh, i don't know demons within her like <laughs> say say this is actually you will be delighted when you read the crappy the, the full script of the crappy crud wagon episode because it deals with this awesome yeah it's I, it, I can't, I can't wait to read those. It's going to be fun to get elaboration upon these uh, characters. I, I wasn't, yeah, it was like the links I had found for the scripts were just like, it was saying like link does not work. So I was like, Oh no, oh, it, it could like be, it, it could be gone in which case I'll have to. Yeah, no, I'm going to we'll revive them. Oh, I have all the original computer discs, uh, you know, cause we had to use 3.5 inch discs back then. And I have them all on my hard drive. Um, so I can, I can provide them if the site has gone down. Uh, ooh. Uh, Nano Fox asked um, Weirdy Beans at <laughs> Oh, it's okay No need to be polite around me Pass me the beans, Weirdy What did you say? Uh, I, I, I meant Weirdy Beans at Weirdy uh, Beans at Weirdy Beans at Weirdy Beans at Weirdy Beans at Weirdy Help me Weirdy Beans at Weirdy I can't beans believe that at. worked You know, it was, seemed like such a crazy crazy thing to say but it, it, it worked we i don't even at the time we were like are people going to understand what's happening in this scene but like i think it worked no that was no it read so easily it's again where it just executives think the audience is just dumb they just think people won't get in this case it wasn't the executives all. it was it was me who was worried that people wouldn't know what the hell was happening but ah uh, um, yeah and well, I'm, I'm, you're, you talk to a lot of executives though too so you get influenced <laughs> by those people. yeah yeah uh last last question i want to do for my uh fans here we got a uh, gamer zo- zoologist asked are takis good in ranch which i just thought was a very strange question but i like that it kind of goes into fast food. i'm well known for my food work as exactly as i want the yeah so i'm happy yes they are that's a good oh. use of takis and Ooh. it's a good use of, of flaming hot doritos as well i'm sorry flaming hot cheetos uh are work spectacularly in in ranch so if you haven't tried it it's a great way to eat them. In fact, I was just eating some last night with the, with the ranch dressing. <laughs> That's so funny. I didn't think I would actually get a, a question on that or an answer on that one. So very interesting. I have an opinion about it. Uh, yeah, and that's where I'm going to, uh, as we wind down this interview, I want to go into more fun stuff. And I want to talk to you about your fast food stuff on Instagram, because I, I bring that up a little bit in my video. Just mention that you're doing that now. And that's uh, just funny because it's it's fun content over there. It really is. Um, Thank you. I know you made me want to go try that Arby's fish sandwich, and I didn't think that you was going to try it. Happen. I you really want to now. I know that video It'll rock was your fish sandwich video. world. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna go try it soon. Um, 
but I, uh, so I want to ask a few food questions. One being, uh, along with that Takis and ranches, I want to ask you, what is one of your food guilty pleasures? What's something? Well, okay, first of all, let me just say for those, for people, I know you have a large audience, so let's promote my Instagram and my food stuff. Yeah, I, please. Yes, hobby, yes, I still write TV. I still write TV. I still uh, work on TV shows, but my hobby is reviewing food. And it's not just fast food. Although I make most of my videos about fast food, I also do all sorts of stuff. You see right behind me here is a whole bunch of stuff people have mailed me from all over the world, snack foods, frozen foods, all sorts of stuff like that. On my Instagram every day, at least on my Instagram story, there's some new thing. Uh, so it's that Bill Oakley on Instagram. Check that out. Even if you don't like food, <laughs> if you're some kind of weirdo who doesn't like food at all, you'll right. still be amused sometimes by my takes and the videos that I do are usually somewhat funny um, that are fast food reviews or something else. So check that out. Anyway, guilty pleasure. I don't feel guilty about eating <laughs> fast food at all. And Good so answer. I don't, I would say the one thing I do, I shouldn't eat so many frozen pizzas. I eat so many frozen pizzas. We're in a golden age of frozen pizzas. There's so many different types of good ones, especially if you are willing to mail order them from other places. Like I have, I wouldn't say that I feel guilty about eating anything. I really think I feel guilty about drinking too much beer, which I do, <laughs> but I do. And that, I would be a lot slimmer if I didn't drink so much beer, but um, I feel that I eat too many frozen pizzas, but I love them and I can't stop. That's a, a fair thing to be addicted to is frozen pizzas. <laughs> um with uh, oh i guess talking about your um uh your channel and everything i i will be i'm gonna mail you i'm gonna mail you some stuff you th you'll throw me your address later excellent you because you yes. did a video or so, no on twitter someone sent posted a picture and you reacted to it it was a bunch of heb chips and H -E -B is our grocery are? store here in Texas. I'm dying for those vanilla. Yeah, those vanilla ice yeah, I'm gonna get you them. I'm, and the and the and the pizza ones. And mm -hmm. there's a third one. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna yes. get I'm gonna get them, and I'm gonna get a bunch of other things and Thank throw you. you a fun gift box. I so. love stuff from H E B. There's been a lady in Texas who's been sending me stuff from H E B for a couple of years now, but I haven't gotten these new chips, and I'm excited. They always have cool stuff at that place. Oh, I'm yeah. very jealous that we don't have it here. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw you a fun Texas uh, Texas gift Texas gift box from me. Um, I just wanted to let you know about that because again, yeah, your your content is really fun and you you cover a lot of different things. You like um, you'll do fast food reviews, like I said, you'll do an Arby sandwich and go try the new McDonald's thing, whatever it is. But you'll also try like you know the vegan like nuggets and things like that, and really try the other spectrum. So it's not just yeah, like it's not just a fast food. Um, review channel it is just a food review channel in that way yeah. with, um, which is what's very cool about it is people can get it from all walks of life it's not just uh do you want to come you want to know what burger is the best well my goal is to turn myself into like another uh, thinking man's guy fear <laughs> so yeah. like I, I as a celebrity and it's it's, it's it, that, although it doesn't pay any money it's actually happening a little bit now I'm on tv I'm on that uh almost every week I appear somewhat on the food that built America on the history channel um, which is, it was my favorite show even before they started asking me to appear, <laughs> but I get to appear and talk about things like tonight's episode is going to be about the history of Carvel ice cream. Mm. And I and know I'm on that, uh, but then there's other many episodes. It's a great show if you like that kind of thing. Um, so I do appear on that. I'm going to be on Somebody Feed Phil on Netflix this year and um, all sorts of other things. My goal is to have to do, unless someone buys Mission Hill, is to do less TV writing and more food celebrity stuff um, because that's more fun. It works for you because you're a writer. You can riff and talk off the cuff, just very educatedly. It's something I've I, I, more have, I have difficulty. It, you know, I, I have difficulty at times doing it. Like I've, I've tried stand up in my past, and I'm like, this is just so difficult. I'm not a great person to just go off off the cuff and everything. You have a really great knack for it. I love listening. I could not really talk. do it four years ago when I started this, if you look at my earliest videos on my Instagram, they're hilariously bland and quiet <laughs> compared to my new ones, but it just took a lot of, it just took practice, honestly, to get to that level. Uh, and then um, what's the Bill Oakley sandwich? You mentioned that in something and I wanted to hear what that was. I will send you anyone who wants the recipe, send me a DM on Instagram, that Bill Oakley, I will send it to you. It is essentially, it's a little bit like a Cuban sandwich, Essentially, it is a grilled ham and cheese sandwich with uh, Duke's mayonnaise and uh, Coleman's mustard. 
and, and a pickle, which is the secret ingredient. The Coleman's mustard, which is from England, is extremely strong mustard that I had not tried until just a few years ago. And now I'm obsessed with it because it's like, it's kind of hot. Um, so anyway, the recipe is very simple. I just explained it. But if you want the specific recipe, DM me and I will send it to you. Yeah, I want to make that. And it's so good. I'm working on a new sandwich too that has pickled onions on it um, that I think is going to be the next, it's going to be colloquially too sandwich um i'm excited about that too that's nice you gotta get it out whenever mission hill 2 comes out or yes mission hill season 2 um oh uh yeah they, they then as a texas person because i know you've traveled a bit i just got i just got to know have you ever been to texas and tried whataburger i have not and i have not been to texas in 20 years okay uh, i am dying to go back there's a sense that there's a ton of great food there um, and I have never tried Whataburger. It's interesting because this is what I've discovered. People from Texas love Whataburger. People who are not from Texas who go and visit don't seem to like it that much. No, that's why I want to know is because I know you've said things like In-N-Out is, is like overrated. And I've kind of felt that way too a bit where I'm like, oh, okay, this is a little overhype. And I mean, as someone, I'm, I like Whataburger. It's fine. I'm like, it's good. But I also am like, is it spec? I don't think, I don't know if it's spectacular. Calm down people. Yeah, some people like to, build it up so i i wanted to i wanted to ever see your uh take on that i'm dying to try it i it. feel like i'm going to be hated in texas if i don't go and i don't like it so ah. i'm a little worried about that but yeah. i want to try uh there's a number of other chains in texas that that are that we don't have here that i'm also dying to try yeah um and in and out i should say is it's not that it's overrated it's very good but it's not worth waiting an hour for if yeah, no, exactly. It's ridiculous. Yes. The line will go around the building into That's the street. Crazy. It's it's worth it is is excellent if you can just get one um in a couple minutes. Um, and it's a good bargain, it's a good deal as fast yeah, as those we'll too. And I love those get. burgers, but the that's the, the the mania for it and people willing to wait in line for seven hours is bananas. Yeah. Uh I yeah, I agree with that. I'm glad we're on the same page there because yeah, I'll go for in and out, but my girl and I will leave if we see the lines too long. Yeah, We're like, well, totally. not, not that good. Not that good. Right. Um, all right, cool. Uh, is there any, um, is there any other food things that you want to uh, mention? Uh, any, any shout outs to uh, tasty foods that you think people should try? Any, any good. Oh, what is it? You have the steamy awards, any contenders yes. so far for the steamies? There, this I year? will sh tell you that there are, um, and I will show you right now, <laughs> two of them. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, I'll show you two of them. The Steamy Awards, I've already got a couple of good candidates, it, one of which is the sequel to the RB sandwich, which won last year, which is the spicy version of the fish sandwich, which was terrific. I had that on Monday. These, these are, I don't really eat that much candy, to be honest. These, these oh. Reese's Cups with the ground up potato chips in them. Yes. Are, this is, the, I can't resist these. No, yeah, and I, I agree. And I usually don't even eat sweets. Have you had those? They're amazing. Yes, they're amazing. Okay, yeah. and then these, these are one of the best snacks I've ever had in my life. I, somebody told me about these and I'm going to be promoting them. I haven't put this on my Instagram yet. These are hot and spicy chicken almonds and they're Korean. You can get them on Amazon. Um, and I, I can't tell what the HBAF appears to be the brand, but I can't tell. I can't really <laughs> yeah. know what it is. But they're like, they got like a, a crispy, a thin, crispy coating on them. And it doesn't really taste like chicken so much as it tastes like fried chicken skin lightly, but it's also wow. a little sweet. And it's spicy, like it's pretty spicy, like jalapeno level at least. Yeah, I like that. Uh, but these are spice. this and those Reese's cups are the two things that I have here that I snack that I'm snacking on myself um, regularly. So there's interesting. There's I like that. I for you. interesting spicy chicken almonds. I'm gonna I'm gonna look those up. There's a couple other things you've mentioned before, and I've just got a little grocery list of like crazy Amazon international items. Oh, I want to. I should also check say out. next month I'm starting. A I'm uh, starting a club. I'm starting a thing uh, called, I'm, this is for people. I'm starting a thing called the Steam Tams Society. Ooh. You know, I wrote the Steam Tams. Uh, of That's course, right. yes. The steamies and stuff father, like one I of the a, fathers of steamed hams. He is the I father got, of a meme. He's a legend here. I, and I have to keep exploiting it for my own personal gain. So I've heard of this thing. It's basically going to be kind of an online club type, Patreon type thing where there's different levels of membership. Where, where, where you get these, the stickers and the t-shirts and stuff, but one of the levels, expensive level, for those of you who make a lot of money, I'm going to mail you this stuff. Like if, every couple of, every month or two, uh -huh. you're going to get a box with my picks in it, you know, Steamy Ward contenders and so forth. So anybody who's got a lot of, well, if you only have a little bit of expendable income, you can join the club. <laughs> if you have a lot, 
you can get the box, which is going to be uh, exciting, fun to compile and send out. That is, that's, that's cool. I like that. It's like a, a mystery box, but it's even more exclusive. It occurred to me, you know, like Jenna Bush has a book club. <laughs> so why can't I have a food club, you know, like, come on. And so like this, so it'd be kind of a food club. Um, it's called Steam Hamp Society. And the full name of it is Steam Hamp Society and Food Discovery Club. I think <laughs> I'm still working on it, but um, it's going to be, I think it's going to be fun. Yeah, that sounds fun. I like that you're, I like that you've kind of found a weird like side gig, but it, total, it totally it pay any fits money, you. But maybe it will when you guys all sign up for the Steam Ham Society. Right. Hey, it could. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have any, any more questions personally myself. This has been an amazing interview. I filled in a lot of the gaps that I had of just questions writing and answered. I think all the questions that I had from uh, fans, other, other things that were just posted were obviously just big love for the show. They are, I'm so ever, glad everyone, to hear that. And I yeah. wish that any of you were powerful TV yes. executives <laughs> so, so that I wouldn't have to go through this rigmarole. They will just be somebody like, more Mission Hill, we'll take it, rather than <laughs> us having to go in and convince, tell them what it is and then convince them that it's going to be good. Yeah, it's it's so sad that you have to do that. The show was amazing. It was, uh, I, I called the Oblongs a hidden gem and I'll, I'll even blaspheme myself and say I Mission Hill was just even better. It was, it was such and as people call it, people like putting things in tiers. It's an S tier show. It's special. It was great. It was, I, I'm, I'm like not going to forget it. That's why I feel so passionate and was so excited that you're willing to do this interview with me because I want to get all as much attention to this, to the show as I can, whether it's just so more people can appreciate it for the amazing quality that you guys did putting in all the work or if it's to actually maybe get more made in the future, which would be fantastic. But yeah. if Thank it's just you. more and people watching for, Mission Hill, that'll be yeah. nice too, but. And all the only place to watch it, by the way, is on YouTube. And even yep. then, I don't think it has the original music. So, but, yeah, but right. YouTube is really, is your primary source for it these days. Yeah, I know. That's so sad. How is a streaming service not even picked it oh, up? Oh, well, the streaming service, they, they get it as part of the deal that we've intentionally withheld it ah, for the past several how years. So smart then. whatever streaming service buys Mission Hill 2, aka Gus and Wally, will get all the original episodes and the, at the rights to make those five episodes that were not mm-hmm. finished. So, uh, I, you know, it seems to me like a very tempting package. No, that's a great, that's a really good idea. That's, it's a show. Yeah, everyone was saying that too. Where, when are they putting it on a streaming service? Why can't I watch it anywhere? I'm just like, watch it on YouTube, dude. I'll throw you the ones right, right here. Right, right. Well, hopefully one of these places will get wise and then they can air the original ones too as uh, to ramp up people. Into everyone these. wants that. Yeah, the original music. They want the original sound. Uh, yeah. every, everyone wants that. It's, it's, there's more people than you realize, than I realize, than these executives realize that want more Mission Hill. And hopefully this, this, the video I've done, this interview uh, can bolster bolster the attention towards it yes fingers crossed thank you so much bill for being on my humble little uh youtube channel just because you're a just a tv god you've been you've been creating my you've been creating laughs for me for years man so we're working on them so i really appreciate it thank you so much my pleasure thanks for having me yeah of course and did you get all that recorded